In the previous lectures, we had defined spherical tensors, uh, how they transform under rotations, what kind of commutation relations they obey, in fact, how to create spherical tensors out of spherical harmonics, even how to combine spherical tensors together to form new spherical tensors and so on. However, one question must have risen in your minds at that point of time, exactly what good are these spherical tensors? Why are we spending so much time on them? So, in this lecture we will try to sort of indicate why the notion of spherical tensors is so important and useful beyond just the well aesthetically pleasing fact that they essentially transform into each other when you carry out a rotation of coordinates. So, to understand this, let us take a look at where the real applications lie and this actually is mostly in the matrix elements or calculation of matrix elements in rotationally symmetrical systems. So, many important systems that we deal with have either exact or approximate rotational symmetry. So, sometimes uh, it may not have a, a system may not have a full rotational symmetry, it may have rotational symmetry about an axis. Even for such systems, what we are saying will work. Uh, we may also have systems which have rotational symmetry broken by a small extra perturbation term and we may actually consider the methods we are describing here as stepping stones towards understanding those systems in more detail. Now, an appropriate basis in which you can describe such systems are basically you know, made out of angular momentum eigenstates. So, kets of the form alpha, I am going to talk about what alpha is in a moment. Uh, notice that it is separated in notation, it is separated from the rest of the labels by a semicolon and then j and m, where j of course stands in for the j square eigenvalue which is j into j plus 1 h cross square and m is a j z eigenvalue. Now, notice that although I am saying j, depending on our system, this could be L or S or the total angular momentum. So, whether it is orbital, spin or total angular momentum depends on your application. Now, what is this alpha? The alpha is really nothing, not necessarily one parameter, it is a bunch of other labels which ultimately completely specifies your system. For example, if you are talking about uh, the spatial wave functions for the hydrogen atom, you do use L and M as labels, but you also have to use one more label to lift the degeneracy there and this label is what you call the principal quantum number n. For more complicated systems, you may have to resort to multiple labels. All these labels which are not related to the angular momentum are coupled together and they are all put in, all symbolically denoted by this single symbol alpha. And this is precisely why I have used sem semicolon in my notation to separate out these non-angular momentum labels from the angular momentum labels. So, of course, these are simultaneous eigenstates of j square and j z with eigenvalues that I mentioned right now. And of course, the labels alpha denote any other quantum numbers. Now, in order to talk about physical properties of such a system, we need to calculate matrix elements of various operators between such basis states. So, a typical matrix element that one would need to come calculate is something like this. The label alpha, j m, the bra corresponding to that and then you have the operator O, then you have a ket corresponding to in maybe entirely different labels. Of course, alpha prime could be the same as alpha, j prime could be the same as j, but in general, you would want arbitrary matrix elements between different states. Now, calculation of such matrix elements is facilitated especially for spherical tensor operators, which is why spherical tensor operators are so important, by a famous theorem. It is called the wigner eckhart theorem. This is a theorem we mentioned at the end of the last lecture and 
this is what we are going to devote today's lecture to. But before we go full blast on the Vignayaka theorem, let us do a simpler version of this. Let us warm up by considering just scalar operators. Remember scalar operators are single operators which do not transform or do not change when you carry out a rotation of coordinates which implies that they commute with all the angular momentum components. So we have the commutator of Jz with s and the commutator of j plus minus with s are both zero. So what do these commutation relations which ultimately define what a scalar operator is tell us about matrix elements of this kind. The scalar operator is sandwiched between two different states. Well, since Jz commutes with s, if you take the matrix element of the commutator of Jzs between the same two states, you must get 0. Now, Jz commutator with s of course is Jzs minus Sjz. So, you have Jz acting on the bra here in the first term and in the second term Jz acts on the ket on this side and this immediately gives us uh, Jz being the operator for which these are eigenstates this immediately leads to m minus m prime times h cross times this matrix element that we are looking for must be 0. So what does this tell me? This tells me that this matrix element must vanish unless m is the same as m prime. Well, we this is not all because not only does S commute with Jz, it commutes with Jx, Jy as well which means it commutes with J square. So this actually if you carry this out the same calculation starting with the J square comma S commutator is 0 and repeating the same procedure we immediately get that this matrix element will vanish unless J equals J prime. So already the commutation relations themselves are telling us that the only non-zero matrix element possible for a scalar operator, any operator which is rotationally invariant are of the form alpha jm, alpha prime jm. So the alpha and the alpha prime, these labels may, may very well differ, but the angular momentum eigenvalue for both j square and jz must be the same for this matrix element to be non-zero. So this in itself is a big thing, but we could figure this out from simple arguments. Well, the next argument is also simple, but it's actually proceeding towards a full-blown application of the Wigner Eckhart theorem, which essentially says that not only do these make these are the only not only are these the only matrix elements which are not zero the matrix elements for different values of m for the same j are actually related to each other. So, notice for a given j, uh, m could take 2j plus 1 values and if you had different m and m prime on both sides, you would have ended up with 2j plus 1 whole square elements. Well, because of the fact that the only non-zero ones are the ones for which m equals m prime, you actually end up with only 2j plus 1 distinct elements. But the important thing is these 2j plus 1 numbers even they are not distinct at least they are not independent they are related to each other in, in a very very simple way. What is the relation? To figure that out let us start with the commutator of j minus with s which we also know is 0. So you of course have this Notice that I have gone back to an arbitrary matrix element. I am not demanding j and m be equal to j prime and m prime right now. But now, remember j minus, uh, well, this is j minus s minus s j minus, and in j minus s, j minus is acting on this bar here. So, of course, it is really the adjoint of j plus acting on the corresponding ket which means j minus really behaves like a raising operator when it is acting on the bra. 
on the other hand in the next term S j minus is acting on the ket so it is really the proper lowering operator. So, if we are careful about this we end up with this expression. Notice this is what you get when j minus acts on alpha j m you get alpha j m plus 1. So, for the bra j minus is really a raising operator with a corresponding factor which is a familiar factor that you get for raising operators. On the other hand in the second term S, S j minus j minus acts on the ket alpha prime j prime m prime. So, m prime gets lowered by 1 and you get end up with the square root of j prime plus m prime into j prime minus m prime plus 1 the familiar coefficient for the lowering operator. Now, and if j is not equal to j prime then these coefficients vanish as we have seen. Also for these coefficients not to be 0 m plus 1 must be equal to m prime only then these matrix elements are not 0 this is what we have already seen in the last slide. So, the only uh, non trivial case here is when j equals j prime and m prime equals m plus 1, but if that happens then it is easy to see that these two factors are actually exactly equal. Notice that m prime being m plus 1 means this is j plus m plus 1, j remember is the same as j prime, this becomes j minus m minus 1 plus 1 which is j minus m. So, this factor here. So, these two square root factors in front are exactly equal in that one case. So, when j equals j prime and m prime equals m plus 1 these two square roots are exactly equal. What that means is that you must have this result for notice of course m prime is the same as m plus 1. So, this is what you have. Now, what is, I, what is this telling me? We have already figured out that the only non-zero values are when j is equal to j prime and m is equal to m prime. So, same j on both sides same m on both sides, but what this is telling me is something even more striking is telling me that even if I increased m by 1 of course, on both sides the value of this matrix element is not going to change. So, what does this tell me ultimately? It tells me that for a fixed j all the 2j plus 1 matrix elements which are not 0 must all be equal. So, it's these matrix elements are completely independent of m. So, they can depend on alpha, they can depend on alpha prime, they can of course depend on j, but they have exactly the same value as for all values of m. So, the, so, one way in which we can we often denote this is using something called a reduced matrix element. So, notice this double bars here are what, a, what we use for reduced matrix elements is telling us that no matter what m you put you get a value which is independent of m. So, if you can calculate the matrix element for a scalar operator for some value of m very often m equal to 0 is one for which the value is easy to calculate you know the value for all values of m. So, this is a very elementary version of what the general Wigner Eckhart theorem is special case for just scalar operators. So, now that we have seen that the special case for scalar operators of course, is pretty easy to derive is also a very simple result in the end, but it is a very striking result matrix elements completely independent of the value of m. Now, that we have seen this let us go on to the general Wigner Eckhart theorem which works for arbitrary tensor operators spherical tensor operators. So, let me state the theorem first the theorem essentially goes essentially looks very simple it is, and it is simple it says that for any spherical tensor operator of rank k the t k q components matrix elements between angular momentum eigenstates can be written down as a product of two terms. One term here is the so called reduced matrix element we just met that for the scalar operator in the last slide, but this is the general case. Notice that what is missing here are the labels q m and m prime. 
So the reduced matrix elements do not depend on Q M and M prime. Okay. But this is not all. The general the general Wigner Eckhart theorem says that there is a factor in front. And what is this factor? This factor is nothing but the Klebsch Gordon coefficient which you get when you are trying to express the state Jm in the sum or as a sum of J prime M prime and Kq. So this is the corresponding Klebsch Gordon coefficient which is sitting in front. Uh, of course, uh, if S were TKQ were a scalar operator, which means K would be 0 and Q of course would also be 0, then the Klebsch Gordon coefficient is trivial is equal to 1, which is why for the scalar operator you had the matrix element of the scalar operator between arbitrary angular momentum eigenstates is equal to this factor and this factor alone and completely independent of M. For a general tensor operator, the result is not independent of M, but all the M dependence note is here in the Klebsch Gordon coefficients. So, this gives us a further motivation for learning how to calculate or understand what the Klebsch Gordon coefficients really are. They are very important for calculating uh, matrix elements for spherical tensor operators. In fact, here we see that the result actually breaks up in two pieces of course the Klebsch Gordon coefficient and this piece which is independent of M, M prime and Q and this is called the reduced matrix element. Notice that this splitting is actually has a deep significance. There is a part the Klebsch Gordon coefficient which depends only on the geometry of rotations does not depend on what operator you are talking about does not depend on what other physical what physical system you are talking about. No matter which physical system, no matter what the specific form of your operators are, uh, no matter what the operator whose matrix element you are trying to calculate is, this factor is completely oblivious of those things. Then it depends only on rotations. Whereas all the physical features here, what uh, which operator you are talking about, this T, uh, which uh, labels other than angular momentum you are using, all of this is in the reduced matrix element. So, th this part, the reduced matrix element, depends on the specifics of the system for which you are trying to apply the Wigner Eckhart theorem. But the first part, the Klebsch Gordon coefficient, depends only purely on angular momentum algebra, has nothing to do with specifics of the physical system. Now, we know that the Klebsch Gordon coefficients are non zero only under very stringent conditions. And this immediately tells me that matrix elements of a spherical tensor operate a component between two angular momentum eigenstates would vanish unless these two quantities conditions are satisfied. Uh, this M here must be the sum of Q and M prime. Also, the j here must be a j value which you can get when you add k, spin k and spin j prime. So, it's sorry, spin q. Uh, there is a problem here, there is a typo of course, a rather bad typo. Mm -hmm. This should be j prime minus k and j prime plus k. Of course, this has nothing to do with either q or m. This is j prime minus k, j has to be within j prime minus k and j prime plus k of course in integer steps in between. So, sorry for the typo here, but you can should be able to figure out that this is nothing but the triangle law for addition of angular momentum. Because only under such conditions are these Klebsch Gordon coefficients non-zero. Well, it is also easy to see that when you take the if you were to take the ratio of the matrix elements of the same TKQ for different J m and J prime m prime values the reduced matrix element would cancel as long as alpha and alpha prime stay the same in both cases and only the ratio of the Klebsch Gordon coefficients decides the ratio of the 
matrix elements, which in itself is a very important result, which is useful for many purposes. Well, I am not going to specify the complete proof of the Wigner-Eckhart theorem here. One approach, I am just going to indicate an approach. One approach just starts from this commutation, j plus minus with tkq, which is a defining commutator. Uh, you take the matrix element of this commutation relation and if you do that of course this is what you're doing you're sandwiching this relation between a bra and a cat on both sides and then you use the fact that you know the action of j plus and j minus both on alpha j m alpha prime j prime m prime just being careful that when it acts on the bra j plus is a lowering operator and j minus is a raising operator and so on if you are careful about that you can immediately write down a relationship like this so it helps us to connect the matrix elements for different values of slightly change values of m here m is minus plus 1 here m prime plus minus 1 here and in this on this side you have of course the result of on this side where q has increased or decreased by 1. Now what is important is that you can easily show and this is going to be an exercise that the klebsch gordon coefficients actually obey a completely parallel recursion relation. So this will be an exercise which I have set for you in a worksheet uh, and can show that both the matrix elements and klebsch gordon coefficients obey exactly the same recursion relation with exactly the same coefficients. Now what that means is that the only difference is whatever initial value you give them which immediately tells you that the klebsch gordon coefficients and the matrix elements have to be proportional to each other with a constant proportionality factor. And this constant proportionality factor of course is what is what you call the induced matrix element. So, just think about it, you should be able to fill in the steps of this proof completely yourself. There are many other ways of proving the theorem, a more elegant ones which involve the way spherical tensors transform under rotations and so on, but frankly all the proofs essentially are pretty easy to understand but they are lengthy, so I am not discussing them in detail now. Let me move on to something more interesting which is how do you actually use the Wigner-Eckhart theorem? So, let's give you, I will give you two examples of its use. Uh, if this had been an atomic physics molecule or molecular physics course or nuclear physics particle physics course, the whole course would have been full of applications of this theorem in various places. So, this is a very, very important theorem for this reason. But let me just point out that if you are a vector this one theorem which is really very Im important and frankly you have actually seen this theorem in use already maybe not in this language. So the theorem says if you have a vector operator A whose spherical components are A1 Q of course a vector operator is a spherical tensor of rank 1 so I put in a 1 in bracket up here where Q of course can take values 1, 0 and minus 1 then you have this one rather interesting result which says that the matrix element of A1Q between angular momentum eigenstates is actually the matrix element proportional to the matrix element of J1Q, where J1Q are of course components of this angular momentum vector written as spherical tensors, as spherical tensor components. But the p-factor is also pretty interesting, it goes J dot A, the dot product of j dot j and a which is a sc scalar scalar operator matrix element of that between the same two states divided by what can be thought of as a length squared of the angular momentum operator notice that this is completely parallel to the idea that if you take the projection of vector a in the direction of vector j what you get is vector j times a number and that number happens to dot product of j dot a divided by the length of j square. This is an elementary thing which you learned long time ago, maybe maybe in class 11, maybe in the first year. 
and what we see here is as far as matrix element between angular momentum eigenstates is concerned ultimately it's as if the projection in the direction of j is the only thing which matters which is why you have taken the matrix element here times the projection times again the matrix element of the j dot operator divided by the matrix element of j square operator now you have actually already used this when you try to calculate say the Landa g factor which relates the magnetic moment of a um, electron to its uh, orbital and spin angular momentum eigenstates you picture of you essentially took the projection of the mu j operator in the direction of j total magnetic moment operator which had two terms one due to angular orbital the other due to spin angular momentum you took its projection in the direction of j and then calculated it uh, in the vector at the model where you have used it you uh, perhaps even justify this by saying that the whole system is rotating about the direction of j so mu l and mu s are rotating about the directions of j so it's only the projection along j which survives well that result is a semi-classical way of expressing what the Wigner Eckhart theorem or in this specific avatar which is the projection theorem says about the system so you have already used this in the vector atom model what we are doing here is providing you a justification from for this from quantum mechanics now how do you prove this the proof proceeds very simply from the Wigner Eckhart theorem if you take the matrix element of a1 q between two angular momentum eigenstates you get a klebsch gordon coefficient times a reduced matrix element for a1 well if you did this for j1 q where j1 q are nothing but spherical tensor components of the angular momentum vector j you get an exactly parallel relationship after all remember the klebsch gordon factor does not depend on which um, operator you are talking about it does not depend on the specifics of the system it is just a f the same factor no matter what physical system you are dealing with no matter what operator you are dealing with the only difference of course is in this thing we are you have j1 substituting a1 by the way j1 plus minus 1 are not really your j1 j plus minus because of the way in which you define spherical vector components there is an extra 1 by root 2 and there is also a minus plus factor so j, j1 plus 1 is actually minus 1 by root 2 j plus whereas j1 minus 1 is plus 1 by root 2 j minus this is just to be, make it consistent for all vector operators so if you take the ratio of these two results we immediately get that a1 q's matrix element will be proportional to j1 q's matrix element and of course j1q's matrix element will depend only on j m eigenvalues not on what alpha and alpha prime are so we are already partly towards the we have already proceeded partly towards the proof there will be no alpha prime or alpha in this result we will just get j1q's matrix element between j m prime and j m by the way for the projection operator you may have noticed I am not saying j prime m prime I am just saying specifically j m prime there is a reason for that it works only when j is equal to j prime on both sides and of course that's multiplied by the ratio of these reduced matrix elements so in order to complete the proof of the projection theorem what we need is to figure out a way of expressing this in terms of the matrix elements of j dot a so that is what we have to figure out notice that one important thing is this particular ratio does not depend on the values of m and m prime involved now we have to start with an expression for j dot a in terms of the spherical vector components now this may seem a bit crazy because we are usually th used to thinking of j dot a as jx ax plus jy ay plus jz az that is exactly what this is I urge you to figure out for yourself that if you were to replace jx jy jz in terms of the spherical components also for ax ay az 
you will end up with exactly this expression. By the way, this expression works for any two spherical vectors, not necessarily just for j and a. So any two vectors a dot b will have, uh, for any two vectors a and b, a dot b will be a 1 0 b 1 0 minus a 1 1, a 1 plus 1 b 1 minus 1 minus a 1 minus 1 b 1 plus 1. This is a simple exercise, work it out. But once you start with this, let us take a matrix element of this between two states with the same j and same m on both sides for the simple reason that that is the only case for which a scalar operator which j dot a is has non-zero matrix elements. So this is what you get. Now the right hand side is pretty easy to figure out j01 gets to act on this bar gives you a factor of mh cross and you are left with the matrix element of a01 j1 plus well the minus sign goes over to, to a plus sign here for the simple reason that j1 plus is defined to be minus 1 by root 2 j plus which of course is y, what gives you a by root 2 here as well as a change in the, changing the minus sign to a plus sign also remember j plus acting on the bra is a lowering operator which explains why this is m minus 1 also explains what the factor is here and so on it's a pretty straightforward calculation now, up to this stage we have not used the Wigner Eckhart theorem, we have just used j dot a and taken its, its matrix element. Uh, but the Wigner Eckhart theorem will tell us that these factors, these matrix elements are proportional to the Klebsch Gordon coefficients, corresponding Klebsch Gordon coefficients, times the reduced matrix element. And if we just use that, the reduced matrix element is the same in all three cases so comes out as an overall factor and you are left with this big messy stuff here. Of course if you wanted to you could calculate the klebsch gordon coefficients involved specifically, plug them in this expression and figure out what this bracket really is. Frankly that is an exercise which I do not fancy doing but because life is not fair I am going to set this exercise to you in our worksheet. However, the important trick which we are going to play here is this, this whole bracket that I have, what does it depend upon? It does not depend on the operator A, it only has the square root factors or the eigenvalues M or the Klebsch Gordon coefficients. So ultimately it depends only on two numbers, it depends on J and M and nothing else. So whatever this complicated thing is, let us call this C of J M, some constant factor which depends on J and M and we are left with this result. Well, by itself this would not be very useful because after all we still do not know what this matrix element, reduced matrix element A of A1 is and the C J M is quite a nightmare to calculate, not really but not, but not very trivial either. But the important thing is this works no matter what vector A you choose. So we have a very simple choice, we could have chosen instead of any arbitrary A, we could have chosen J itself. So if you choose J for A here, this of course becomes J square and on this side we have the matrix element for J1. But same factor C J M, this is important, the coefficient does not depend on what the operator is. So the, so the great thing about it is, if I divide the two, this messy coefficient CJM just cancels out. So that's rather clever. And you end up with alpha j a1 alpha prime j reduced matrix element divided by alpha j j1 alpha prime j, which remember is the ratio that we needed to complete the proof of the projection theorem, is simply the ratio of these two right left hand sides here. And j squares expression value between these two states is simply the eigenvalue j into j plus 1 into h cross square. So this is what this prefactor really is and this is all we need to complete the proof of the projection theorem. So this was one application of the Wigner Eckhart theorem to prove for us a very important result the projection theorem which is really the one of the major ingredients in the vector atom model which we use to describe various aspects of atomic spectra. 
I will round this off with just one more application. This is a very very important application. This is for something called selection rules. Now we have not studied electric dipole rotation in detail in this course as yet, but we will. But basically, if you have radiation shining on an atomic eigenstate, thus perturbing it and sending it to another eigenstate n prime l prime m prime, the probability of the transition depends on this matrix element. This for a specific kind called electric dipole radiation. We will study this in more detail later. But this matrix element is what really controls whether the transition will at all occur or if it occurs how in strong it will it be which essentially means how intense the spectral lines will be or how strongly will the atomic system or the molecular system that we are describing absorb the light. So, one very easy application of symmetry which does not involve the Wigner Eckhart theorem but which I am showing you here because it is a because it is useful and B because it sort of uh, mimics the more complicated application of symmetry for rotations is that for parity. If you undergo if the whole system undergoes parity that is if you change r to minus r everywhere the integral involved will not change because after all the in this matrix element is after all a three dimensional integral and the integral of course does not depend on which dummy variable you use whether you use r or whether you use minus r. But under parity we know that the angular momentum eigenstates or by the angular momentum eigenstates lm change by a factor of minus 1 to the l which means they do not change at all if l is even but they become a minus sign if l is odd. r of course picks up a minus sign under parity. So, the overall thing cannot change it is very easy to see that the only way this is possible is that if L prime and L have opposite parity. So, if L prime and L have opposite parity uh, this will I, if this picks up a minus sign this will not or vice versa of course R picks up a minus sign. So, the two minuses that you get will give you a plus. If on the other hand L prime and L have the same parity that is they are both even or both odd then both L prime or L will either pick up a plus or a minus sign which will cancel and R will check with a minus sign which means the matrix element will change to its negative and yet stay the same which means it must vanish. So, this actually tells you the dipole transitions between states with the same parity are forbidden. Strictly speaking they are forbidden to first order in perturbation theory they may come back as higher order terms, but those higher order terms are typically very small. So, even if such spectral lines between S with the same parity both even or both odd are not completely 0, they, there may be some such lines, but they will be very very faint. Now, beyond this there are many more selection rules and they come out of the Wigner Eckhart theorem. Not only Wigner, does Wigner Eckhart theorem gives you selection rules here, it actually goes a long way in predicting the intensities of those lights, in fact it can tell you how intense one line is going to be compared to another. So, let us remember that this is the matrix element that we want to calculate, the mod square of this is essentially what gives you the transition rate or the intensity of the spectral lines and so on. In order to use this we are going to write the components x y z of these of this r vector in terms of spherical vector components. Just to remind ourselves the spherical vector components t 1 1 t 1 0 t 1 minus 1 relevant here are written in terms of x y and z in this form. Again remembering that there is a minus sign in that plus plus 1 a plus sign in the minus 1. Now, what I need is this thing turned on its head that is x, y and z in terms of spherical tensor components which is pretty easy to do. Just solve these and you get x, y, z in as this. So, matrix element of say the operator x between two angular momentum eigenstates is really the matrix element of t 1 minus 1 minus the matrix element of t 1 plus 1 
within and then divided by root 2 and similar statements can be made about y and z so these matrix elements once you invoke the Wigner-Eckart theorem breaks up into a reduced matrix element which depends on the details of the states and what kind of sta what which states you are going from which states you are going to and so on and what the precise uh, nature of the wave functions etc are but they have a p factor which depends only on the klebsch gordon coefficient and from the properties of the klebsch gordon coefficients it is very easy to see that these matrix elements will vanish hence the transition will be forbidden if um, the matrix elements corresponding to addition of 1 with L does not give you L prime. For this, of course, for this to happen, for addition of 1 and L to give you L prime, L prime can be either L itself or L prime can be L plus minus 1. That is the range which is predicted by vector addition. These are, remember, are the only cases for which the Klebsch-Gordon coefficients do not vanish. Also, because the Q values here are minus 1, plus 1 or 0 depending on which operator you are talking about, for the X and Y polarization of light, the selection rules must be M prime must be M plus minus 1. For Z polarization, M prime, where Z is of course T1, 0. So, if you are sandwiching a T1, 0 here, notice M and 0 must give you M prime. So, M prime must be M. So, ultimately, these are the selection rules which electric dipole transitions between different atomic states obey and the reason why they obey them are the klebsch gordon coefficients. Actually from the values of the klebsch gordon coefficients and the ratios you can actually predict how intense one light is going to be compared to the other. In fact you can even predict how intense one polarization is going to be compared to another. So all that is additional detail and we will explore a bit of this in a further worksheet later. However, I hope this has been able to convince you that spherical tensor operators actually help you to do many calculations which would have been otherwise very difficult in a much simpler way. And this is ultimately the reason why we have spent so much time on them. In later courses like particle physics courses, nuclear physics courses or more advanced atomic or molecular physics courses, you will see many more applications of the Wigner-Eckart theorem and spherical tensors. Bye for now.